everyone and welcome to another video from Objective 350. My name is Claire Henny and this week we're going to be doing something a little bit different. So this video is not necessarily about clearing something up. Instead, it's about addressing something, appreciating something that we really should address and appreciate. And that is history. More specifically, the history of climate change and environmentalism from I decided from the 1960s to today because the 1960s in my opinion is when the movement really started kicking up but if you want another video I can go farther back just tell me if you like this one first in 1960 the world's population blooms to 3 billion people and it is partially because of this that in 1963 the U.S. passes the Clean Air Act. Now, 1955 saw the passing of the Air Pollution Control Act. Despite the name, it didn't actually endeavor to control air pollution. Instead, it allocated money to the research of air pollution. In my opinion, the Clean Air Act is better because it actually attempts to control air pollution. It's a huge step forward in the environmental movement because people begin to acknowledge that there is something wrong. The bill is all-encompassing. It has 11 titles that in some way address an effect or a cause of air pollution. The problem is that it needs an entity to enforce these laws and enforce these programs. And this is where we begin to see the need for the EPA. In 1968, the Apollo 8 mission snaps a picture of the Earth rising over the moon's surface. It is the first time that the world has seen the Earth as a fragile or breakable object. And this brings us right into the 70s. Nearly anything that happened in the 1970s, at least something that was environmentally related, had begun because of something that happened in the 1960s. You see so much research and consciousness pouring out of that decade that, of course, it spills over and creates the mentality that forms the 70s. The most notable example of this is, of course, the EPA. They are established in 1970 when Nixon signs an executive order, and what they do is write legislation that will go through Congress that will hopefully come back to them so they might protect the environment. They enforce the laws that they have written in the hopes that it will reduce carbon emissions or that it will enlighten the public in some way. One of the big things that the EPA handles is the Clean Air Act. That 1963 act didn't just stay a piece of legislation, it wasn't static. It evolved as we learned more about climate change. You're going to hear more about that when we get to the 90s, but right now we're going to mosey on over to the 1980s. The 1980s where we see the environmental movement, or at least the portion of it, that was sparked by our space race wind down. Um, it actually begins with the election of Reagan in 1980. Specifically, this spells bad things for the EPA. Between 1980 and 1983, it loses one-third of its budget and one-fifth of its staff. But this did not spell the end of the environmental movement. It turns out that Reagan's policies on our environment and climate change proved so unpopular to the public that in 1988, his vice president, George Bush Sr., declared himself an environmentalist. The 1980s also sees a splintering of environmental groups. There are the mainstream ones and the radical ones. Some of these include Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, and Earth First, whose slogan is no compromise in the defense of Mother Earth. However, they were often known to employ rather extreme tactics. It's a give and take. They did a lot to help the movement, and they also did some things that dissuaded people from joining the movement. It is from here that we can jump into the 1990s. By the 1990s, perspectives have changed. We're no longer simply focusing on the United States, we're focusing on the global environment. This is when we see treaties and conferences and things of that nature that reach out and try to encompass everyone. And as promised, the Clean Air Act is back. In 1990, there was an amendment added that put a lot more responsibility on our federal government to protect our atmosphere and our environment. There are stipulations about acid rain 
and toxins that had been released into our atmosphere. And this all plays into a global state of mind. The atmosphere belongs to everyone. It's something that affects all countries, regardless of creed or nationality, or race or religion. It's big. It is because of its sheer importance that in the 2000s, a lot more is done to protect it. The 2000s are similar in a way to the 1990s. It is here that you see the rise of a group called the IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In 2001, the IPCC releases its third assessment report in a series of what is now five. Um, thus far, they've released one every five to seven years, and they generally give an overview of how our climate is doing. Now, 2001 is often cited as the first time there is an overwhelming consensus that we are doing something bad to our climate, and we need to do something to fix it. 2007 sees the fourth IPCC report that states that the change in the climate is unequivocal, and that it's likely due to greenhouse gases. It's the first time that we are really pushing for a change and for the acknowledgement that we are indeed doing something fairly detrimental to our Earth. And we're finally up to our decade. And our decade has seen a lot of turmoil and a lot of promising improvement. In 2010, the CCL was established, or Citizens Climate Lobby. They're an organization that pushes normal people like us to address their congressmen and women in the hopes that those men and women will push legislation through to protect our climate. 2010 also sees the BP oil spill off the Gulf Coast. Roughly 3.19 million barrels of oil are spilled into the ocean. 2014 sees the People's Climate March, in which hundreds of thousands of people, including our own Emma Vaghi, turn out to New York to demand action. It's a truly inspiring event, and then, not to toot my own horn or anything, but 2015 in February sees the beginning of Objective 350. Then, just a couple of weeks ago, President Obama signed his executive order that forces federal agencies to cut their greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, that is what our next Let Me Clear Something Up video will be about. So, thank you for sticking with this whole video, if you have, and please, stay informed.